Welcome to the Climate and Coordination Rcast, where every week we'll be discussing topics related to all things climate change and our chain's role in the solution. We will be discussing technologies that can adapt and coordinate massive amounts of data like never before, forming social architectures that grow collective intelligence, sharing and evaluating data planetarily, all while maintaining personal privacy and personal data ownership. A new decentralized economy is forming as we move from the third industrial revolution digitization, to the fourth, decarbonization, by building a co-op built on a correct-by-construction, concurrent, scalable solution, our chain is structured to build out the new technology that will be required for a flourishing regenerative planet. Please join us on this journey. Okay, great. Well, thank you uh, to everybody for joining today's Climate and Coordination Rcast. We're so excited to be here for another week, and we have a fantastic special guest today. And um, I know that Daryl will give you a little bit of background on her, but please welcome Jubilee to our call. And uh, you can take it from here, Daryl. All right. Yeah. So um, I guess it was a couple weeks ago, I was watching a Daniel Schmachtenberger video on YouTube, minding my own business, and um, uh, it was uh, it was actually from the Rebel Wisdom uh, YouTube channel, and uh, he was talking about probably his favorite subject, the war on sense making. Um, and um, by the way, I learned about Daniel Schmachtenberger through uh, a member of the co-op, the uh, collective intelligence pioneer Jim Whitescarver. Um, and uh, and so you know I've be, I've be, I've been a fan ever since of Daniel Schmachtenberger and Jim, um, but uh, so um, so anyways uh, on the next the next video that YouTube's AI machine um, wanted me to look at was um, this response video from this woman named Jubilee, so I clicked on that and checked it out and uh, thought. Um, what she was making made a lot of sense, and so I decided to contact her. Um, so, uh, so Jubilee has this um, project she's just getting going with uh, called Together Tech, um, and uh, and she's setting it up as a co-op. So I thought um, it would be nice for us, perhaps, to talk a little bit about that and um, see where the see where things go. So yeah, so here's um, so yeah, Jubilee, thanks for joining us on this call. Thank you for inviting me. I always love when people find my stuff on YouTube through the, through the algorithm and it always seems to happen at the right time. That particular video is uh, dear to my heart because again, <laughs> that was the first time I encountered Game B. The first podcast I watched was Daniel Schmachtenberger's War on Sensemaking. I went out for a walk and there was something that like alt circle, I was doing it, that I needed to do that video when I got back. I was like, oh, this guy's talking about what I've been thinking about and feeling in the realm of for the last few years. And so I don't, that was back in September and so much has progressed since then. We are also trying to start a technolo- technological cooperative it started as more of like a global cooperative in general, the power and potential of a global cooperative. Um, and then realizing, of course, the power of tech and that that is where the biggest bang for your buck is, as well as where a lot of the current potential is and doing it together instead of letting it, leaving it up to the big, big uh, corporations. I got in contact with some people in Game B doing, and we started having weekly meetings, board, live board meetings online for Together Tech. Right now, Together Tech is a group of people with their own projects that are coming together to try and find common solutions to our common problems. Um, So things like marketing and finance that we're all trying to do for our own projects. My project under that umbrella is solution raising. I am in the process of working out with other people, how can we create solutions from the bottom up with 10,000 people? What could a process look like? What can those conversations look like? So it's not a dispersed uh, 
governance system of like, we make decisions and disperse it to you, but like, how could 10,000 people be as involved as they want to be in creating a solution that they want to be a part of? And I'm very much in the, the muck and the mess of, of living in that chaotic <laughs> learning journey. I'm passionate about co-ops, so I chose to wear my co-op shirt backwards today. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's all the, all the proponents of a co-op. Democratic, member-owned. Co-ops are democratic. Co-ops are member-owned. What else does it say? Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> co-ops are... <coughs> oh, co-ops put people first. Co-ops build community. I can read it better this way. Community. Co-ops make the world a better place. Trying to read in a mirror image. <laughs> <laughs> Upside down is the in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, apparently Leonardo da Vinci could do that, but uh, yeah, I, I certainly lack that skill. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, that's a cool shirt. Um, yeah, so do you know, did, did you do any any research on Archain or... Before our conversation, I did, and I and I know it's a member-owned technology cooperative, which is definitely we're in alignment there. Of the that, that is what the world needs, and it needs it desperately. Uh, is Steve here? Hello. Hi, Steve. I have, I have a question. Hey, you. Steve. Um, hey, Greg. I'm so sorry. <coughs> Do you mind muting yourself? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. So, I thought yeah, I was so, muted. My apologies. Oh, that's um, okay. I heard what you said about ground up and I'm wondering if you have looked at the history of the open source movement in particular, because often what happens is it's a seed of an idea. Um, it for some reason or other gains popularity, gains a bit of gravity and more and more people start to flock to it. And part of the reason I think people like open source or like to contribute to open source is, is, is that word contribute that actually really is important. Generally, people contribute to open source not because they're looking to make a buck, but because they believe in what they're doing. Um, there's a, an interesting graphic. I'll see if I can find it. It's a visualization of the open source movement from the perspective of Bitcoin. And it, the first time I saw it, it was in a, uh, a talk given by Miko Matsumura, um, who's the founder of Evercoin, um, big blockchain ch chain guy. And, and graphically, it shows the development of the open source repository and, and how the community builds graphically. And, and I'm wondering if that's something that you've looked at, because I kind of really liked what you said. I am definitely into open source. I come to this technological world in a different way where I am not a techie. I am not a coder. I'm not, I just can see tech that I wish existed so I could use it. And so with open source, particularly just like co-ops, I'm passionate about their existence, but I'm also <clears> frustrated <throat> because I can never use open source. Someone just posted in the, in the chat box my, my Wix website for Together Tech that I did two years ago because it's what I was capable of doing. Um, but it hasn't really been updated in two years and it's, it's more my version from two years ago. It's not the current Together Tech, what we're doing. And open source doesn't seem to have enough money behind it to, and then it forks and you don't know which one. So like for tech people, it's awesome because who cares if it, anyone else is using it, you can use it, you can change the code. But when you don't have a way to say, this is what doesn't work for me, can the tech people please solve it? Um, I just feel like there's anything we create in Together Tech that is ours will, will most likely be open source because it is a powerful way to develop trust and transparency. But a guided open source of, right, and how do we make this usable and beautiful at the same time and have enough funding to make sure it stays in existence without needing it to be a non-open source technology right where we're proprietary and making money and like can we get the best of all worlds yeah I, th I think the that that whole open source thing I've posted the link by the way of the video um and the fact that you said that you know you're, you're not really an IT person I, I mean I am an IT person but what I find fascinating about the video which is why I mentioned it because what you said so resonated is um you know, in the world of data science, we're always looking for some representation of the data. 
that somehow works for us, that gives us meaning, maybe insight over and above what you're seeing on a, on a screen. And what I find interesting about that video is um, I'm really fascinated about the social dimension of it, not the technology dimension. And the video kind of shows how a core community builds and then offshoots occur. And, and sometimes the offshoots get really big too. And, and so it's giving a, a representation purely from, um, I think, the commits into the GitHub from different people in different groups. Um, uh, and I, I, I'd love um, people that are experts in sociology and psychology to have a look at that, because I think one of the challenges for a global co-op um, is you know we, we don't really have one you know, there isn't one that's really truly global so we're, we're building the plane whilst we're flying it often um, and and I'm always looking for insight into that I mean uh, Daryl is on the governance committee with me um, and and we're always trying to challenge ourselves to think about well what do we need to do next to go the next step to be more decentralized, to give power to the members more and more. Um, and that's a real challenge. It's a real challenge. Um, I, I did find that when I was thinking about that journey, I'd be interested to, 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 to hear more about your journey. But I, I, talk, I had a dialogue with Roger Hallam in Extinction Rebellion because I was curious to know how did they start? You know, they're decentralized, but, you know, they started with a core, but they put decent decentralization at the top of their agenda. Well, second, actually. First was save the planet. Second was do it in a decentralized way to, co to force cooperation, I think. Um, so I'd be interested in, in, in any wisdom and any um, observations that you have in your cooperative journey that we can learn from in our chain. So we're not very far in our cooperative journey. I'm passionate about cooperatives. But like I said, I, I went to the, literally where I got this shirt, I went to a meeting for BC cooperatives and I was, we went around and introduced ourselves in co-ops and I'm like, I am part of the smallest co-op that hopes to be the biggest <laughs> co-op, right? Like I'm in one single individual in a co-op hoping to start a member cooperative that anyone and everyone can be part of. That has definitely shifted to be the tech cooperative. And like I said, now we're bringing project people with projects together to find, can we create um, solutions to our common pain points so that these, these different projects can get into the world. That's how Together Tech is, is figuring out how that, that piece of it. And my umbrella is very much in what you're taught. Like I'm trying to figure out how can we not just create a cooperative and then have members and have them be involved, but actually have 10,000 members come and create a cooperative right? 10,000 people come and coordinate on a solution and implement it in a way that people feel empowered and part of that solution in a way that they don't feel with businesses, right? Or even open source stuff where they're like, I use it, but I don't, if I can't code, I'm, I'm not necessarily involved in, in the process. I don't own Mozilla, even if I want mm. it to exist. How, how did you, given that co is a recent, a relatively recent thing, in your life um you know, what compelled you to find out about them and then what what was it that when what was that moment when you suddenly thought oh my god this is where i need to be hmm. it's a good question i feel like i've known about co-ops for a really long time i worked for van city which is the uh, largest credit union maybe in the world definitely in north america and realizing the power of, of democracy in small groups and that under the economic system, the power of having either a worker cooperative or consumer cooperative. I don't like, it's not something like 9-11 or the Berlin Wall falling that I can say like, yes, I remember that period of time. Like it's, it was such an incremental working and then wanting to learn more about it and, and going to this hippie business school where a lot of people were starting worker cooperatives and consumer cooperatives and just getting more delving into it. What does it take to start one? I've never actually started one. I've worked for them, but I've never actually 
started one from the ground up. And even that process is very like to start a cooperative, you have to start a BC cooperative in British Columbia. And then you have to go, if you're a certain kind of cooperative credit union can't, you can go federal. There's no such thing, of course, as an international one, except for platform cooperatives, which are kind of like, like Facebook, from what I understand is out of the United States, I think is where they're incorporated. I might be wrong on that one, but they have people from all over the world and they're clearly not a cooperative. So having someone doing something like that is like a platform. You can be in one location under our economic system. And I'm trying not to use game B language. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to talking with those people 90% of the time. I want to bring that lingo in. That, um, and that is, I mean, I don't think anyone has figured that out because it ends up being platform, which is more Facebooky. How do we, like, that's something we all have to figure out together, right? How do we have members all over the world with different currencies, with different languages, with different laws, and have it be effective in, in working together? And so yeah, instead of trying to find a way for 7.5 billion people to coordinate, I'm trying to find a way for 10,000 people to create a solution that they want to be part of without needing to co-opt anyone else to force them to be part of it. Yeah. Is there anything special about 10,000 to you, the number of people that <clears> you mentioned? <throat> No, it's just that uh, the idea for the solution raisings is that we come up with a solution that we could implement if we had 10,000 people and $100,000. Just because the math works, 10,000 times 10 is 100,000. So everyone puts in $10. It's not a big risk for any singular individual. And, and 10,000 people is big enough that it would be hard to work with and small enough that it's beyond feasible. You can find 10,000 people to work on anything. Just be like, yeah, I want to. Now working through how you could work through with 10,000 people is what process raising is and it only just started this week yeah wow that makes a lot of sense um there was uh something that happened this past week that was in the news and i i daryl if it's okay i would love to just bring it up and see what everybody's thoughts are um talking about you know technology and cooperation and everything um there was uh an announcement that spotify had paid joe Rogan, well, I don't know if all the money went straight to him, but it was over $100 million, this deal to acquire his podcasts, which formerly went on YouTube, but he's promised to delete all of the past podcasts from YouTube, which actually is kind of sad because, I mean, there's like a lot of great information there. But anyway, going forward, he's going to be on Spotify, I guess now. And Spotify is, you know, trying to become the next like podcast giant. And, um, what this got me thinking about was, you know, obviously a lot of my friends who are musicians and artists and different people like that were posting about it. And they're like, oh, wow, Spotify paid a hundred million dollars for Joe Rogan. And I just, I had to comment a couple of times being like, no, they're paying for the data of Joe Rogan's fan base, you know, of the listeners. It's not for Joe Rogan. It's for the access to the data that he provides of such a huge swath of people and um it's just funny to me that a lot of people don't realize still that you know how, how much that data is worth and that it's going to be sold you know and um you know but it's not just for joe rogan like spotify does not i'm sure there are a few people that work at spotify that enjoy listening to Joe Rogan, but that's not the reason why he's so valuable, you know? So I was wondering if anybody has any comments on that, because it was a big story this past week, and I think it has a lot to do with what we're talking about right now. Well, I think of it in two different angles. Uh, one angle is the thing that I've said over and over again, that Spotify isn't a music company. It is a data company. Um, their business model is based on what you said, it's surveillance capitalism. That's their business model. Um, so um, uh, it makes sense that they would want to do this. The other angle I look at this is that um, uh, this is really bad. <laughs> and, and the reason why I think it's really bad is to, um, tr to, to uh, they're, 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 they're going to, commoditize something basically what's going to be interesting is going to be interesting to see how joe rogan changes because he will his show will change and it will and and i think uh you know i'm disappointed in him you know i i, I was a fan i know am no longer because of this decision that he made um i don't know if anyone else shares my 
stri- strong feelings about that. But I, <laughs> I, think, I think it was really, really stupid. Um, but, you know, he made 100 million bucks, so he's... Well, yeah, it's, I, I, I wonder if his show... I mean, I'm, I'm curious about how many listeners he's going to lose because now he's doing, you know... He often talks to, like, political leaders and tech leaders and innovators and different people about surveillance capitalism or related subjects. So it's going to be interesting, you know, um, what he talks about. And I wonder if this deal is not actually as valuable as they think it is because a lot of his listeners have the same attitude as you, Daryl, that they're just like, well, you sold out, you know? So now they're going in the different direction. Now, you know, they're going to have these super long conversations. And actually, I'm curious about if the conversations are going to be the same length. And I'm also really curious to see how this move changes his show, Daryl, as you said. So anyway, I'm sure we're getting a little bit off topic here with this whole tangent, but I've really been thinking about it and I was hoping I could ask about it today because it was just really fascinating to me. And Steve, I think you're absolutely right about the ownership stuff. I think that's a huge piece to it. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's that far off from the main topic, right? Because I think one of Jubilee's uh, fundamental questions is governance, right? And, and what this really is about is, you know, where is the governance? And in the case of Joe Rogan, you know, Joe Rogan controls who he wishes to spend his time with. And, and there's, there's not much we can argue about that. So, yes, it's true that he's selling the data of, his, um, of the people who listen to him, but they listen to him. They don't listen to, they don't listen to anyone else. <coughs> they, they listen to his conversations and they're interested in the guests that he brings on. So it's, you know, and I think this is one of the most interesting things, both about open source and about decentralization in general. The nice thing about all of those is that when there is a difference uh, of opinion in terms of features, functions, or direction, um, then the community can fork, right? A group can say, well, we're taking the code in this direction and you guys can, uh, or you folks can take it in that direction. And that's, that's, uh, off. That's that's a an, that's something that nature does all the time. <laughs> As a beekeeper, I can tell you this is something nature does yeah. all the time. <laughs> Tis the season, Greg. Tis the season. We've already had two swarms. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, so I, I I guess my my point is that there, there's, um, but but nature is is also provides this ability to to reconnect the forks, right? So you get diversity and you get um, uh, reconciliation. And, and I think that that's necessary for a robust and, and healthy system. And so I'm curious as to what Jubilee has, has thought in terms of, of these governance models, right? So do you support forking? Do you support <laughs> reconciliation of forks? You know, what, what are your thoughts on this? I was actually wondering when you said that nature, I understand how nature forks. When you say it comes back together as a biologist, how does it come back together? Maybe I'm missing what, what it is. So for, so for example, in, in, the case of, in the case of the bees, during the, during the uh, flight of the queens in the summer, the queens are inseminated by all the surrounding, uh, the drones from all the surrounding hives. So it, it, at least in that sense, uh, at the genetic level, the... Uh, the, the hives are coming back together. Got it. Yeah, I was thinking it more of the forking of species, and that's kind of the point, is that they actually can't come back together once you've actually forked into species. And I would have to sit with that longer because there is something about that that is part of my issue with open source, is that when it forks, it doesn't kind of come back to... There's something beautiful about that and also something that dissipates the energy and the power of technology. And so... In my vision, there's something like a central pool of data and stuff that is um, the same and everything feeds back into it and uses it from there. So it doesn't matter if you fork because the information is going back. And so if there is a, you know, a, a social media platform that we created and then someone forks it, that information's back in the system, which is open source, which is what all open source is. But it's like when they fork it and they decide to make it for just vegans, well, any information they have 
is still being fed back in the system, right? The people, the videos they're creating, the stuff, so that if they did want to fork it something different or somebody else wanted to, to do something pre that fork, they could still be using that data, that there's a way to do it that's the best of both worlds. Does that answer the question? I would be, um, sometimes I, you know, I'm a quite political person and I'm not going to get into politics now, obviously, but I do sometimes wonder what the history is of other countries, like political parties. Like, did they start with less or sorry, I should say fewer parties and then fork or split off into more because, you know, often in American politics, at least we talk about this, how like, you know, we have these two parties, but maybe it's three and then maybe it's actually five, you know, like the super right, kind of like middle right, and then maybe independent, and then kind of like neoliberal left, and then, you know, the progressive left, and then obviously there's a the Green Party and some other stuff in there. And, you know, people always talk about how, you know, maybe life would be better, elections would be better if we had more political parties, but then it's like so hard to create a new political party. And so actually I've just inspired myself to do more research on how that happens because um, obviously, you know, well, Steve can talk about this because there's so many different parties in the UK and other places. And I, that might be an example of a successful, you know, situation like that within a group of people, you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because uh, Jubilee and myself are Canadian and here in Canada, we have, um, five, five, six parties, five, five parties that are represented in our parliament. So we have the Green Party, the Party de Quebecois, which is uh, Quebec's mm. party. Then we have the Liberal Party, which is the current leading party. Then we have the Conservative Party and the New Democratic Party, the NDP. Um, and so I, I, I think that what that has done is made uh, our democratic system more healthy and robust. There's lots of discussion that happens, quite heated sometimes in Parliament. Um, you know, but we have a Green Party represent, or is it two, Jubilee? How many Green Party representatives do we have now in Parliament? Is it just Elizabeth May? Um, I, don't, I don't know, because I honestly don't pay attention to what's oh, okay. happening. I'm busy, like, I'm, I'm kind of like ignore the politics that's going on as much as, as I can to like, how do we create this from the ground up? Because the, I don't have enough spoons for all of it. So I, don't I think you have to do it that way, way Jubilee. I think you have to do it that way. And partly, it's, it's interesting that, that people dive into political parties. The problem with political parties is that they end up being defined in some way, shape or form, or, or being a reflection of the electoral system in which they have to exist. So the higher the degree of um, representation of the individual at an election, the more likely you'll have a hung parliament and the more likely you'll have collaboration. And if you have it more first past the post, the more likely you have competition and not collaboration. And that's why you see things the way they are. In the UK, it is first past the post. And that's why we have what we have. Now that we're leaving, well, we've left the EU. When we were in the EU, we actually had a, a PR system, a proportional representation system. And so in the European Parliament, there was much more collaboration. But you know, if you, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not fond of, the, since COVID-19, I've kind of stopped looking at the politics of a lot of things um, because there's so much noise. But if I go back to Findhorn, so I don't know, Jubilee, if you've heard of Findhorn. I know in Canada, there's a whole bunch of eco villages and there are in the States too. And there is an eco-village network, a global network of eco-villages. Most of the eco-villages, if they're not cooperatives as such, they behave like them. And so in the genes of each of these villages, and Findhorn, spelt find and horn, is kind of the mother of all of them. And the governance model there, and kind of Greg said it, you know, you could split, um, you know, they've been going since 1963. They've done everything that you can do governance wise that anyone's ever thought of thus far. They're a UN heritage site for the way in which they collaborate and their sustainability credentials. And, and I, I was there a, about a year ago having a discussion with them on that very topic. How do you achieve consensus and what happens when you have a minority that really doesn't want to go that direction? 
And their answer was, they, they, they told me two things. They said, first of all, when you start an eco village or an intentional community, call it what you will, um, and, and that could be a cooperative too, that it, it, unless you have common cause, you have to have something really core to, to, to what makes you want to work together. Because that common core is what gives you the seeds of trust, right? You tend to trust people that have your own political persuasion or common sets of beliefs. You, you afford them more trust than somebody that walks in, you know, in the old anti-apartheid days, you know, being a South African and Cape Coloured, if I heard a white South African accent, the hairs on the back of my neck would stand up because I didn't trust them. I mean, it's been a challenge for me personally to actually embrace that accent as a South African. Um, uh, so with cooperatives, the ones and eco villages, the, the ones that succeed have the highest cohesion around the common principles. And then what they do is they, they work some, when, when something goes wrong and they split, it's usually because there is a principle at stake but they at least know what principles they agree on and cooperate. So when they split, they do cooperate naturally. So all the eco villages from Fintorn in 63 onwards, this is kind of the story of how it happened. Tamara in Portugal, there's one in Greece and there's some in Canada as well. I, I think that's how, how they did it, which is why I think from an R chain perspective, why I've always said, that the manifesto for our chain, which is above the strategy of the organization, but which is really giving us, these are our fundamental principles. Um, it has been, you know, whilst we've been working on it, it is fundamentally important to the growth, I think, of a global cooperative, because it won't be one unit, it will be many cooperatives that are bound together by some very, very important common principles and values that allow us to, or on, a, on a sort of cooperative by cooperative basis, figure out where the points of contact need to be and how that needs to work. Well, I, I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that, Steve, because I, I wanted to follow up on the question I asked Jubilee. Um, and and you, you, you've provided a really nice um, uh, uh, sort of um, practical framework or, or practical metaphor in which to expose some of the inner workings of our chain itself. Um, and so, so the, the first thing I, I want to point out is that you could consider the U.S. as a fork of the U.K. Um, but then you can also recognize, then I think it's really straightforward to recognize that, that the U.S. and the U.K. still in, uh, are involved in trade. Right? There's, there's still a connection between those two countries. <clears throat> um, and in general, um, you know, we, uh, as, as groups sort of find, their, find um, themselves and th then they have to work together within the larger framework of the, uh, of the globe, which, which means trade, commerce, exchange of ideas, et cetera. So there is a, a coming back together a mechanism, you know, even within human society. And that we have tons and tons of examples of this. Our chain um, supports this in the technology itself. So in particular, if, if a group decides to fork the, uh, the, the, the tech, uh, one of the things that, that we recognize inside the tech is being able to mount other chains as, as a sub chain of the uh, of the chain that you've got. So within our chain, the sharding solution makes it possible not only to mount shards of our chain, but to mount, <coughs> mount forks of our chain and to mount other chains such as Ethereum. Um, and, and, and so the, the idea is to build an architecture that makes it possible not only to fork, but also come back together. And if you think about the economic interests, uh, uh, most, if you uh, and just compare it to the examples of forking a Bitcoin, right? Most people who have uh, been engaged in um, the the Bitcoin forking activities hedge on both sides of that fork, and so then and and then almost immediately there's a pressure to be able to do exchanges right between the two different kinds of tokens that arise. 
right? So, so you'll, you'll see that there are trading pairs between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and so on and so forth. So, so there, there is per force uh, uh, pressure to uh, provide for these kinds of reconciliation mechanisms. And so Archain just recognizes that that's a fact and then, and then provides technology to support that from the ground up. Um, and I, I, am, I would look for uh, uh, an analog of this in the governance protocol. So it's perfectly okay for people to disagree. I mean, if you, if you think about it, right, it, it's built into uh, most species. Uh, you know, uh, there are lots and lots of primates um, where, where the, the males uh, move on to other troops. Uh, and this is, this is a part of, you know, the cultural mixing process. It's certainly, it, it is almost uh, certain that uh, uh, there's, there's a biological uh, um, mechanism which causes discord between parent and teenager. <laughs> um, so, that, so that you create the conditions whereby the, the, <clears throat> the progeny can go off and, and, you know, find their own, um, you know, find their own uh, life, you know, so set, set themselves up. And, <clears throat> And, and yet, that doesn't mean that there isn't down the line further exchange. So that seems to me to be a very, very healthy process and one that, that we need to be able to support, which is, you know, this, this idea of a loyal opposition or, or somehow, you know, even though we disagree on these points, we're still, we're still all living on planet Earth or uh, whatever our commonalities are. And as a result, we, we must engage, we must uh, connect. So uh, this is this is something that I think is uh, uh, needs to be a part of the governance process, and in particular uh, for a decentralization effort, we have to be able to to support when someone finds their own voice. You know, this is this is the direction I want to go, and whoever wants to go with me, you know, you're welcome. And then eventually, there's a there's a reconnect of of uh, at the at least two groups and, and possibly others. Is this making sense? Yeah, more or less. I mean, that is that is forking. And I like the idea of having a system to bring things back together. I think part of what, like what Together Tech's doing right now, it's kind of um, dealing with people with their own projects coming together, right? And so we're figuring out how would you bring people kind of together, even though that's not actually what we're concentrating on eventually we would like them to be under the same umbrella when people feel comfortable with that. So it, we're kind of like figuring out the forking or the coming back together from the forking without having ever forked from, from something and playing in that ego <laughs> capitalism, like all of the stuff that comes up to play in it. Uh, a big part of what we do is these, what uh, my brother, who's also on the board um, talks about is cooperation that like him and the and Bentley both have sense making projects, but they differ enough that they both need to exist. And at the same time, they both help and hinder each other, right? And so like playing in that space of like, wait, if you exist, I probably won't exist. We both have big, really big ideas for this. And at the same time, they're, they're helping each other. So like bringing people with common projects together to say, hey, how could these food co-ops or how could these food Everyone who thinks they have the solution to food, how can they work together to, to actually help themselves be out in the world? And yeah, the forking one. I just wanted to reiterate from, Steve had asked if I, Finlorn, if you'd asked if I'd known Finlorn, I can remember the name of that. I absolutely do know that. I'm part of one of the co-housing in Vancouver and I'm familiar with co-housing. I was, I, although I don't live there, I was part of the instrumental part of creating the co-housing, going through the process of deciding what we were gonna create what are those governance structures? How are we going to decide on things? And one of the ironies, so I don't live there, but they all live there. And I have asked them two years into the project where there's been conflict, sorry, two years into them living there, because it's about eight years into the project. Um, if they were to start a new co-housing community, what they would want it to centralize around, right? That because um, some of the, we worked with one of the big architects in co-housing and what he said, like everyone argues about is, is child raising, pets and food. I think that the three are the three things and probably money. And anyway, I was expecting all of those answers, right? I was expecting the vegans to be like, I'd start a, co a community of vegans and the, the very devout 
Christian to be like, I'd start a community of Christians. In fact, when the person who was Christian who I thought would say that didn't say that, I, I was like, but wait, wouldn't you want this? And he was like, no, Christianity is central to my life. But if I questioned it, I'd then have to leave my community. I want this diversity here. Like I want to be, this is my home. And it's, so they don't work together, but they live together. Right. And that's kind of very much by design because, then it, and yet there's conflict that does come up around child raising. This is how you should raise your kids. This is how kids should act in the courtyard. No, my kid's not going to act like that in the courtyard. And finding those those dynamics of you do want a central, right? We all care about the environment. We all care about living in community and intentional community, but we don't necessarily have the same values on all of it. That being said, everyone who lives there highly valued common dinners as one of the things that fall away from other co-housing. And in this particular one, we've had common dinners for four meals a week ongoing up until COVID-19 when they stopped. I don't think I answered your, your, your question, Lucius. I'm sorry. I don't know if there was a question. Was commenting. And my kids just here, so just one thing. Well, that's awesome. I'm not really that familiar with those kinds of co-housing cooperatives, although I did go to a boarding school in the wilderness. So <laughs> that's really not the same thing. But um, I'm, I, I think it would be really cool to visit one of those one time mm. and see what life is like over there. Um, cause I've, I've actually never even been to one, but it would be cool to visit, especially from what Steve tells me about the one that he talks about, or maybe it's the same one, I'm not sure, but, um, it sounds like an amazingly cool experience. You know, I think that, um, you hearing what you said then, uh, and I, I had this picture in my mind of, uh, of something fractal like, right? So if you create um, a, an entity, a cooperative, um, with members, um, you, there's a, there's a fractal nature in how the next one gets created and connects to the, 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 the mother, as it were, that gave birth to it. Um, the, the, the challenge to us, I think is, and it's a challenge that agile delivery methods really hit you with which is you know, the notion of retrospectives, the notion that you're going to be wrong. Get over it, learn. As long as the fractal nature of the first one starts up and everyone accepts, you know, there will be change. We don't know what it is. We will be alive to it to learn from the experiences of all the members of being part of this cooperative. And we will take it on board. And as long as that's enshrined in the overall structures um, that you have, then you, 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 what you can't do is say, oh, in 10 years' time, there'll be 20 characters and they'll all work like this together. <laughs> that, that, that would, if you had that foresight, you would certainly be far better than Miss Trelawney and Harry Potter. <laughs> right? So... And she wasn't very good, as it turned out. Um, so you just have to be alive to the fact that there's a, there's a, it's a weird thing. There's a degree of trust that people that want to be part of a cooperative largely subscribe to all the things on your T-shirt. And that's what's your guide. And that's what you trust in as you start to build more smaller co-ops that work together that you're all kind of singing off a similar hymn sheet it may be difference nuanced and subtle differences in other ways and sometimes in a co-op or, or like in an eco village you just end up having um uh, a strong individual against a strong individual and there's no way they can occupy the same space and they have gravity so people gravitate towards them and so in the end one moves and that's just the order of things, I think. What you've got to do is latch on to the fact that that's kind of what happens. And that's okay. It's okay for the one that's going off to start their own. And it's okay for those left behind. What's much more important is that you continue to cooperate and find ways to do it. We wow. don't reflect on things like that too much. Steve, that, <laughs> that was, was awesome. so... That, yeah, that was awesome. Um, 
we have I'm a hippie what can I say <laughs> we have a few minutes left so I'm not sure if anybody has any final thoughts um, but we could also potentially leave it at that very inspirational uh, place so uh, maybe we'll edit this at the end but <laughs> what do you guys think I, I would I, I have one one request I guess yes um, of course you're looking forward i i would love um to have a stronger part to play observer or otherwise in some of the work that you do jubilee and i would like to extend that offer to you too because we are going through lots of issues about governance um and maybe it's an opportunity to learn from both our mistakes and our successes as we mature. So I would mm. like to foster that relationship. I think that's I a good I, idea. I yeah, don't know exactly yeah. what that looks like, but I am definitely down with that. Whatever, whatever that looks like. Oh. Everything I create, everybody is invited to. Literally everybody. Like, besides process raising, only because we're trying to have a tiny group of people to figure out what that looks like before opening it up to everybody. The together, even the together tech board meetings where like if somebody shows up who doesn't who doesn't fit in here, we'll figure that out in the moment. We're dealing with it in a very agile way of like, let's just not fix problems before they occur. Let's have them break and then fix them and do it all openly and transparently. So even when we fail, there's no failure because the next iteration will learn from it. Absolutely. I applaud that sentiment. Well, this has been a fantastic call, I have to say. And Daryl, I want to thank you so much for inviting Jubilee Briscoe on. Jubilee, so fantastic to talk with you. Um, I guess everybody can find out more about Together Tech on the website, right? TogetherTechTEC.org, is that correct? No, because no. that okay. website's really outdated, unfortunately. I did oh, link okay. in the comments so we'll, we'll here. We'll delete a, that in um, editing, don't worry. <laughs> there's, a, there's a, Facebook, uh, a Facebook group called game b projects that's a whole other story that is together tech's uh facebook group at the moment we're trying to figure uh -huh. out how to come up with those omni win common solutions to our projects and then i have my own facebook channel that is jubilee saves the world by meandering through life where i'm talking about my journey and just like my ideas and it's very chaotic it's like whatever's newly coming up in the moment of like right now we're doing solution raising and, and project raising um, awesome. but yes, okay. my name is Jubilee Briscoe, and you can find me on Twitter at Crowd Democracy or on Facebook. But I won't let I won't friend people. I'm not already you know. Don't awesome, know cool. Okay, great to know that you're on Twitter as well. So, um, okay, well, I want to say thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. Thanks to everybody who um, who listened uh, or is listening or will listen to this um, our cast, uh, and we look forward to doing more in the future. So you can subscribe to our chain on uh, YouTube, and also you can become a member of our chain at rchain.coop. And if you'd like to be a guest, uh, let us know at climate at rchain.coop, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And thanks again so much to you, Jubilee. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Special.